I'm Lisa Sewell and I teach in the English department and I'm not, I want to emphasize, not the director of this um, wonderful reading series, um, but I do have the privilege of um, teaching with the director, Alan Drew, um, for the class that we run with the series. And I just would like everybody to give Alan a big hand. Um, It's his first year at Villanova, and I think he's done a fantastic job of organizing and running um, this this series this semester. And I want to just thank a few other people, um, Sally Grooms, Alan's grad assistant. I don't think he could have done it without her. She's just been fantastic. And I also want to thank the co-sponsors of the reading series, um, especially Evan Radcliffe, the chair of the English department, for his um, immense support of this series. The College of Arts and Sciences, um, Africana Studies, the Library, the Honors Program, the Writing Center, Irish Studies, and some other programs to have um, sponsored this, this series. We have one more reading. Um, we thought it was going to be earlier in the year, but it's going to be the very last day of the semester, next Thursday the 30th in this room at 7.30, Yi Yun Lee is going to be reading. She's the author of the novel The Vagrants Just Out and um, Praise Like Crazy um, in the New York Times and other venues. And also of uh, the short story collection, A Thousand, oh, I totally forgot the name of the book. A Thousand Years of Good Prayers. Thank, thank you, Noel. Um, but uh, tonight we're gonna listen to poetry we have Adam Zagajewski here, and he's agreed to answer questions at the end of the reading and to sign books. So um, after the reading, feel free to ask him some questions. And before we hear from him, we're going to hear from two students from the class Alan and I teach together. Sinead Clockley and Colleen Curry are going to um, introduce Adam Zagajewski. We are honored to have with us tonight Adam Zagajewski, one of the most highly regarded Polish poets writing today. Born in Lwów in 1945, Mr. Zagajewski entered the world at a tumultuous and transformative time. He spent his childhood in Silesia, a region of Western Poland, before attending university in Krakow. He is considered one of the pillars of the new wave movement in Poland, and as a member of the generation of 68, took part in a literary and cultural revolution that swept the region. Mr. Zagajewski's first poems were works of protest, a theme that he has since left behind, and his poetry today has been called luminous, meditative, and immense. He received a fellowship from the International Kunstler Program in 1979 and spent two years in Berlin before moving to Paris in 1982. While in Paris, Mr. Zagajewski spent half of each year teaching in the United States in the creative writing program at the University of Houston. In 2002, he moved back to Krakow and is now a faculty member on the University of Chicago's prestigious Committee on Social Thought. In addition to writing poetry, Mr. Zagajewski is also an acclaimed essayist, having written on topics ranging from contemporary cultural contradictions to a reflection on his own life, the subject of a memoir published in 2000 entitled Another Beauty. His writing has earned him many accolades, including the Prix de la Liberté and the Kurt Scholsky Prize, as well as the fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation. His poem, Try to Praise the Mutilated World, was published in The New Yorker following the ter terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Though written a year and a half before the tragedy, the poem managed to strike a particular chord among its readers and gained Mr. Zagajewski a wide and varied American aud audience. The public's response to that poem is testament to the universality that Mr. Zagajewski's eloquent work allows, despite its deeply personal undertones. As our class began to read Mr. Zagajewski's work a few weeks ago, we were struck by the beauty and immediacy of his poems, even though we were reading them in translation. We started by comparing the official translation by Claire Cavanaugh, a renowned American Slavic studies professor, with a literal translation by our own Professor Wojciech, and finally with the original Polish, of which we understood pretty much nothing but tried to pick out the alliteration. In our study of translation and discussion about the process, we were struck by the universality of Mr. Zagievsky's imaginative meditations on metaphysics, nature, human suffering, and happiness. His figurative language was infused with, the appro with approachable diction, and we were able to grasp and unfold the depth of his poetry. 
Mr. Zagievsky writes about the importance of poetry in our world today and how it changes the way we think about our place in that world. As we've discovered over the past few weeks, the universality of the human experience as explored in Mr. Zagievsky's poems can alter one's thinking, whether in Polish or translated into other languages and read in other cultural contexts. As Sinead mentioned, his, his poem, Try to Praise the Mutilated World, brought comfort to a nation far away from Mr. Zagievsky's own home. The power of his poetry to connect across language and cultural barriers is evident, and we have all learned a great deal from reading his work. So without further ado, Mr. Adam Zagievsky. Good evening. Thank you for this beautiful introduction. Uh, it's always a little bit exaggerated, but that's a part of the genre. But thank you. Very well done. So, if this were an opera, I would have to. You'd have. You'd see. A, um, a warning that the main singer has some problems with his voice. This mic, I'm a little sick today, not too much so, but a little bit so. But this mic is my friend, I feel it, so it should be okay. Um, I'll start with two poems that I will read in both English and Polish. So in the, in the class before I said I actually don't like to do it, but um, you, you usually contradict yourself. The, the first poem um, is Burgundy's Grasslands. Burgundy's Grasslands scale the hills, then lies still, inert as cloth on a hanger. Despairing, we know nothing, nothing. Minimalist memory, restricting itself to what actually happened, is helpless before Romanesque schemes that weren't built. A surveyor raven methodically measures a field. Ash trees, no one would accuse of being esthetes, erect lush leafy tents. Larks race madly from one cloud to another, like waiters on Sundays in crowded cafes. We know nothing. Weeds sprout faster than our thoughts. In a village church not far from Vesle, there's no one but a priest, no, young, no longer young, who sings mass, so utterly alone said the tear which gathered for 300 years behind the eyelid of a cracked bell is ready finally to fall, then stops. No, not yet, not as long as the lonely keep singing. So now the Polish original. Łąki Burgundy. Łąki Burgundii wspinają się na wzgórza i leżą na nich nieruchomo, jak ubrania na wieszaku. Nic nie wiemy, rozpaczliwie nic. Pamięć jest minimalistką i ogranicza się tylko do tego, co się wydarzyło. Jest bezradna wobec romańskich, niespełnionych możliwości. Gawrą metodycznie jak geometra mierzy pole. Jesiony, których nikt nie oskarża o estetyzm, potrafią same stworzyć bujne namioty liści. A skowronki z szaleńczym pośpiechem biegają między obłokami jak kelner w zatłoczonej kawiarni w niedzielę. Nic nie wiemy. Chwasty 
które są szybciej niż myśli. Weszliśmy do małego kościółka pod wezle. Nie było tam nikogo poza niemłodym księdzem, który śpiewał mszę świętą. Był tak zupełnie sam, że łza od 300 lat formująca się pod powieką pękniętego dzwonu gotowa była wyruszyć w ostatnią podróż. Jednak zatrzymała się. Jeszcze nie, jeszcze nie, póki samotni śpiewali. And uh, as a poem also by Lembrou, it's called Electric Elegy. Um, doesn't need much explanation. I, I mentioned several political leaders of bad reputation. Electric Elegy. Farewell, German radio, with your green eye and your bulky box, together almost composing a body and soul. Your lamps glowed with a pink, salmony light like Bergson's deep self. Through the thick fabric of the speaker, my ear glued to you as to the lattice of a confessional, Mussolini once whispered, Hitler shouted, Stalin calmly explained, Bierut hissed, Gomulka had endlessly forced. But no one, radio will accuse you of treason. No, your only sin was obedience, absolute tender faithfulness to the kilohertz. Whoever came was welcomed, whoever was sent was received. Of course I know only the songs of Schubert brought you the jade of true joy. To Chopin's waltzes your electric heart throbbed delicately and firmly, and the claws of the speaker pulsated like the breasts of amorous girls in old novels. Not with the news, though, especially not Radio Free Europe or the BBC. Then your eye would grow nervous, the green pupil widen and shrink, as though its atropine dose had been altered. Mad seagulls lived inside you, and Macbeth. At night, forlorn signals found shelter in your rooms, Sailors cried out for help. The young comet cried, losing her head. Your old age was announced by a cracked voice, then rattles, coughing, and finally blindness. Your eye faded, and total silence. Sleep peacefully, German radio. Dream Schumann, and don't wake me when the next dictator rooster crows. <clears throat> yeah, this was a German radio because um, my family was, was expelled from the eastern city of Lvov and sent to Silesia, which belonged to Germany before the war. So the poor radio was German. Okay, so I read it in Polish, if you have patience. Elektryczna elegia. Żegną cię. Niemieckie radio o zielonym oku. Ciężka skrzynko, składająca się nieomal z ciała i z duszy. Twoje lampy żarzyły się różowym, łososiowym światłem, jak głębokie ja u Bergsona. Przez grubą tkaninę pokrywającą głośnik moje ucho lgnęło do ciebie jak do kratek konfesjonału. Szeptał niegdyś Mussolini, krzyczał Hitler, 
tłumaczył coś spokojnie Stalin, syczał bierut, bez końca przemawiał Gomułka. Ale to mi nikt nie zarzuci zdrady. <śmiech> Radio. <śmiech> nie. <śmiech> Jedynym twoim grzechem <śmiech> było absolutne posłuszeństwo. Czuła wierność kilohercom. Kto przechodził, był wysłuchany. Kto nadawał, odebrany. Przecież wiem, że dopiero pieśni Schuberta przyprawiały Cię o najwyższą szmaragdową błogość. Walce Chopina sprawiały, że Twoje elektryczne serce biło delikatnie i mocno. I materia osłaniająca głośnik unosiła się jak piersi zakochanych dziewcząt w dawnych powieściach. Co innego wiadomości, zwłaszcza gdy emitowała je Wolna Europa albo BBC, Twoje oko stawało się niespokojne. Zielona źrenica rozszerzała się i kurczyła, jakby pod wpływem zmiennych dawek atropiny. Mieszkały w Tobie szalone mewy, magby. Nocami zbierały się w Twoich pokojach zagubione sygnały. Żeglarze prosili o pomoc. Płakała młoda kometa, która straciła głowę. Towarzyszyłem Twojej starości. Oznajmił ją, ochrypły głos, urywane zdania, potem trzaski, kaszel, wreszcie ślepota. Morskie oko zgasło i głucha, głucha cisza. Śpi spokojnie po niemieckie rady. Śni o szumanie. I nie zbudź się, gdy zapieje następny kogut dyktator. Now I read a few uh, new poems. Oh. This poem is, uh, all, all these poems are translated by Claire Kavanagh, not the older, the two older ones uh, by Renata Gorczynski and C.K. Williams. Impossible. It's so difficult trying to write, whether at home, in a plane, over the ocean, above a black forest, in the evening quiet, always starting fresh reaching full speed and 15 minutes later reluctantly, reluctantly giving up, surrendering. I hope you hear me at least, since as you know, the theoreticians ceaselessly remind us that we've missed the point. As always, we have overlooked the deeper meaning We've been reading the wrong books, alas. We've drawn the wrong conclusions. They insist, poetry is fundamentally impossible. A poem is a whole where faces dissolve in a golden haze of spotlight, where the fierce rumblings of, of an angry mob drown out defenseless single voice. Then what? Fine words perish quickly. Ordinary words rarely persuade. All the evidence suggests that silencium claims only a handful of adherents. Sometimes I envy the dead poets. They no longer have bad days. They don't know ennui. They've parted ways with vacancy, rhetoric, rain, low, low pressure zones. They've stopped following the astute reviews, yet still keep speaking to us. Their doubts vanished with them. Their elation lives. Uh, we spoke a, 
in a class about about the music. Um, so I have this very new poem, a recent poem called Piano Lesson. This is a childhood poem, so you have to imagine somebody like this. Piano Lesson. Piano Lesson at the Neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. J. I am in their apartment for the first time, which smells different than ours. Ours has no smell, it seems to me. Rugs everywhere, thick Persian carpets. I know that they are Armenians, but don't know what that means. Armenians have carpets. Dust wanders through the air, imported from Lvov, medieval dust. We don't have rags or Middle Ages. We don't know who we are, maybe wanderers. Sometimes I think we don't exist, only others are. The acoustics are great in our neighbor's apartment. It's quiet in this apartment. A piano stands in the room like a lazy, tamed predator. And in it, in its very heart, the black ball of music resides. Mrs. J told me right after the first or second lesson that I should take up languages since I showed no talent for music. I show no talent for music. I should take up languages instead. Music will always be elsewhere, out of reach, in someone else's apartment. The black ball will be hidden elsewhere, but there may be other meetings, revelations. I had it home head hanging, a little saddened, a little pleased. Home where there was no smell of Persia, only amateur pictures, watercolors. And I thought with bitterness and pleasure that I had only language, just words, pictures, just the world. I'll read a few poems from Eternal Enemies as well. But it's such a pleasure to read new poems. Even if you are sick, it actually heals you a little bit. Um, this is a poem called Café. And um, it was written or it's set in a cafe in Berlin. And I make a, a reference to the once very famous novel by Malcolm Lowry, Under the Volcano. I don't know whether this novel is still being read. Um, I laughed at it once. As you may remember, those who read it, the main character is hopelessly alcoholic. Café. In that café in a foreign town, bearing a French writer's name, I read Under the Volcano but with diminishing interest. You should heal yourself, I thought. I'd become a Philistine. Mexico is distant, and its vast stars no longer shone for me. The day of the dead continued, a feast of metaphors and light. Death played the lead alongside a few patrons at the tables, assorted fates, prudence, sorrow, common sense, the consul, Ivan. Rain fell. I felt a little, I felt a little happiness. Someone entered, someone left, 
someone finally discovered the perpetuum mobile. I was in a free country, a lonely country. Nothing happened. The heavy artillery lay still. The music was indiscriminate. Pop seeped from the speakers, lazily repeating, many things will happen. No one knew what to do, where to go, why. I thought of you, our closeness, the scent of your hair in early autumn. A plane ascended from the runway like an earnest student who believes the ancient master's sayings. Soviet cosmonauts insisted that they didn't find God in space. But did they look? Uh, now, this poem is different. It's called um, Writing Poems. Writing poems is a duel that no one wins. On one side, a shadow rises, massive as a mountain range, seen by a butterfly. On the other, only brief glimpses of brightness, images, and thoughts, like a match flame on the night when winter is born in pain. It is trench warfare, a coded telegram, long watching, patience, a ship that sinks and sends out signals and stops sinking. A cry of triumph, loyalty to the old silent masters, calm contemplation of a brutal world, explosive joy, ecstatic, unsatisfied, regret, everything passes, hope, nothing is lost. A conversation without a final word, a long break at school, when the students are gone, the defeat of one weakness and the start of another, endless waiting for the next poem, a prayer, mourning for a mother, a momentary truth, complaints and whispers in a scorched confessional, rebellion and magnanimous forgiveness, Squandering the whole estate, remorse, ascent, sprint and stroll, iron, cold gaze, profession of faith, diction, haste, the cry of a child who has lost his greatest, his greatest treasures. <laughs> Um, I will read now a, a self-portrait poem, a recent one. It's simply called Self-Portrait, and the date is 2008, so it's quite recent. So soon it won't be uh, self-portrait. Keeps growing older, frayed costumes, reads a lot sometimes vanishes in books like Indians in trackless jungles, repeats himself. It all repeats, yellow notebook in his pocket, music's summons. Evening, he moves to the window in a rumpled shirt and yawns. Looks a little different in every picture. His father's face invades his own slightly melancholy face. The short, white beard his enemies insist must signify capitulation. The eyes gaze at the lens with hope, growing older. Likes water, flat, sleepy rivers and the green ocean. 
When swimming, his body disappears in the dark currents as if temporarily testing another mode of being. The wind takes his breath. Night bestows absolute peace. The only absolute we've got, a friend, scoffs. They've been arguing for a decade now. A citizen, he thinks of his injured country, the garden of childhood that never was. Takes lots of trips. Up April in Belgrade, the pockmarks of a recent war. The swollen Danube calls to mind its carefree early years in Germany. Jerusalem in May. More traces of war. But holiness drifts above the legendary city like the scent of magnolias. A journalist's questions seem uncannily familiar. Strangeness grows. Always the same, early breakfast, after lunch, a long stroll, slowly becoming a fixed object. Dreams drag him below, dawn deftly rescues him. But this is I, still I, ever searching and shapeless, always I, every morning opens a shining new chapter and can't finish it. This is I, on the street, at the station. I, hearing a child's cry, students laughing, a starling's shriek. The eye of ignorance, of uncertainty, of desire, expectation and wild joy. I, who understands nothing, answers insults, wavers, tries to start fresh, guards himself in conversations, in despair, in learned debates, in a winter day's quiet. This is I, bored, resigned, unhappy, haughty. This is I, daydreaming like a 12-year-old, deathly worn like an old man. I, in the museum, at the seaside, in Krakow's main square, yearning for moments that doesn't want to come, that hides like mountain peaks on cloudy afternoons. Illumination finally arrives, and I suddenly know all. I know that it's not me. So maybe now a few thoughts from from uh, eternal enemies, and then I will return for a moment to new points. Um, this is, there's this poem which is a kind of travel poem. It's called Unroot, and it has 14 short sections. I won't be pedantic, I won't read the numbers, just the titles of the words. Without baggage. To travel without baggage. Sleep in the train on a hard wooden bench. Forget your, your native land. Emerge from small stations <coughs> when a gray sky rises and fishing boats head to sea. In Belgium, it was drizzling in Belgium, and the river wound between hills. I thought, I'm so imperfect. The trees sat in the meadows like priests in green cassocks. October was hiding in the weeds. No, ma'am, I said, this is the non-talking compartment. A hawk circles above the highway. 
it will be disappointed if it swoops down on sheet iron, on gas, on a tape of tawdry music, on our narrow hearts, Mont Blanc. It shines from afar, white and cautious, like a lantern for shadows. Sagesta, Sagesta is, you know, a temple, city, right? On the meadow, a vast temple, a wild animal open to the sky. Summer. Summer was gigantic, triumphant, and our little car looked lost on the road going to Verdun. The station in Bitum. Bitum is a very ugly city, in, but the ugliest city in Poland. In the underground tunnel, cigarette buds grow, not daisies. It stinks of loneliness. Retired people on a field trip. They're learning to walk on land. Goals. Eternity doesn't travel. Eternity waits. In the fishing port, only the gulls are chatty. The theater in Taormina, which is, of course, Sicily again. From the theater in Taormina, you spot the snow on Etna's peak and the gleaming scene. Which is the better actor? A black cat. A black cat comes out to greet us as if to say, look at me and not some old Romanesque church. I am alive. A Romanesque church. At the bottom of the valley, a Romanesque church at rest. There is wine in this cask. Light, light on the walls of old houses, June, passerby, open your eyes. At dawn, the world's materiality at dawn, and the soul's frailty. Now a different poem. Um, the, I, I was once invited to a commencement <coughs> ceremony in the, the theater school in Krakow, and there was a diction teacher who was retiring. And it struck me as, as an event, an important event. The title is the diction teacher retires from the theater school. Tall, shy, dignified, in an old-fashioned way, she bids farewell to students, faculty, and looks around suspiciously. She's sure they will mangle their mother tongue ruthlessly and go unpunished. She takes the certificate. She will check for errors later. She turns and vanishes off stage in the spotlight's velvet shadows, in silence. We are left alone to twist our tongues and lips. Uh, maybe I read for you two poems on my father. I have a very old father who. <coughs> the, the first poem goes back a few years ago when his memory was working. Um, and the second poem, he, he's now completely memory less. So. But the, the title of this first poem is In a Little Apartment, and it has an epigraph. I asked my father, What do you do? all day, I remember. Um, there may be a few things that you will not 
quite understand that. Okay. Um, so, in the dusty little apartment in Gliwice, in a low block in the Soviet style, that says old towns should look like barracks, and cramped rooms will defeat conspiracies, where an old-fashioned wall clock marches on, unweary. He relives daily the mild September of 39, its whistling bombs, and the Jesuit garden in Lvov gleaming with the green glow of maples and ash trees and small birds kayaks on the Dniester, the scent of wicker and wet sand, that hot day when you met a girl who studied law, the trip by freight car to the west, the final border, 200 roses from the students grateful for your help in 68, and other episodes I will never know the kiss of a girl who didn't become my mother, the fear and sweet gooseberries of childhood, images drawn from the calm abyss before I was. Your memory works in the quiet apartment. In silence, systematically, you struggle to retrieve for an instant your painful century. And now this other poem. So I, I definitely will find it. Don't worry. Unless my clients are sick too. And then no way. Yes, I have. Um, this poem is much more recent, and the title is Now That You've Lost Your Memory. Now that you've lost your memory and can only smile defenseless, I want to help. It was you, after all, who opened my imagination like a demiurge. I remember our excursions, woolly clouds swimming low over a damp mountain forest. You knew every path in those woods. And the summer day when we scaled the heights of a lighthouse above the Baltic and we watched the endless rippling of the sea, its white stitches frayed like basted seams. I won't forget that moment. I think you were moved too. It seemed as though we saw the whole world, boundless, calmly breathing, blue and perfect, at once distinct and hazy, Near and far, we felt the planet's roundness. We heard the gulls who played at aimless gliding through warm and chilly currents of the air. I can't help you. I have only one memory. to come from internal enemies and then you must be exhausted by now. If I am so you must be even more so. Um, this is poem called Poetry Searches for Radiance. 
Poetry searches for radiance. Poetry is the kingly road that leads us travels. We seek radiance in a gray hour at noon or in the chimneys of the dawn, even on a bus in November where an old priest nods beside us. The waiter in a Chinese restaurant bursts into tears and no one can think why. Who, know, who knows, this may also be a quest like that moment at the seashore when a predatory ship, ship appeared on the horizon and stopped short, held still for a long while. And also moments of deep joy and countless moments of anxiety. Let me see, I ask. Let me persist, I say. A cold rain falls at night. In the streets and avenues of my city, quiet darkness is hard at work. Poetry searches for radiance. in this room. It's, this one is called Self-Portrait Not Without Doubts. Self-Portrait Not Without Doubts. Enthusiasm moves you in the morning by evening, you lack the nerve even to glance at the blackened page. Always too much or too little, just like those writers who sometimes bother you, some so modest, minimal, and un underread that you want to call out, hey, friends, courage, life is beautiful, the world is rich, and full of history. Others, proud and serious, are distinguished by their erudition. Gentlemen, you too must die someday, you say, in thought. The territory of truth is plainly small, narrow as a path above a cliff. Can you stick to it? Perhaps you straight already. Do you hear laughter or moments of celebration? Oh, sorry. Do you hear laughter or apocalyptic trumpets? Perhaps both. A dissonance, ungodly grating, a knife that skates along the glass and whistles gladly. And I'll finish with another self-portrait, a, a more recent one. Uh, this one is called uh, Self-Portrait in an Airplane. How good that water exists. <laughs> Self-Portrait in an Airplane. Crouched like an embryo, crushed into the narrow seat, I try to remember the scent of fresh-cut hay when wooden carts descend in August from the mountain meadows, skidding down dirt roads, and the dr driver cries out as men always do in moments of panic. They scream that way in the Iliad, and have never fallen silent since. Not during the Crusades, or later, much later, nearer us, when no one hears them. I'm tired. I think, I think about what can't be thought, 
the silence that reigns in forests when the birds sleep, about the coming end of summer. I cut my head in my hands as if shielding it from destruction. Seen from outside, I doubtless seem immobile, almost dead, resigned, deserving sympathy. But it's not so. I'm free, maybe even happy. Yes, I hold my heavy head in my hands, but inside it a poem is being born. Thank you. Questions now? Okay, are there any questions? Yes. How many poems do you complete during the course of a year? Uh, um, I need five years to complete a collection of poems. Usually it's not so stiff, but usually around five years. So it means maybe 12 poems a year. One for each month. <laughs> yes, true. Um, I read in some of your books, but talk about philosophers, and I'm thinking particularly of one conversation with Nietzsche and um, uh, Kierkegaard on Hegel. Uh -huh. And it made me think of what Plato called uh, the old pearl between poetry and philosophy. Uh, he read one sentence in the antithesis of the other. And I was just wondering what, what drove you to write about philosophy and if you thought that was a pearl and if so, where you stood on it? Uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, I, I think I, what drove me to it is my interest makes an amateur interest in philosophy. Uh, plus this, uh, with this, uh, this, for example, this poem Kierkegaard on Hegel, it just starts from a wonderful observation by Kierkegaard who said that Hegel is like somebody who builds a wonderful palace, but for the time being uh, lives in a shack. So it's so poetic, you know, that they have this idea of uh, criticizing Hegel's uh, ambitious plans of, of um, uh, having a system that would encompass everything and, and lead to a ideal state. And I love Kierkegaard's irony about this. And Nietzsche. Nietzsche is just, well, the, Nietzsche was somebody I, I read a lot as a young man. And I had a long history of, of um, admiring Nietzsche and rejecting him. So it just arose, arose out of this, my private private discussions with, with Nietzsche. Uh, yes, I think there's a tension between, maybe not a quarrel, but a tension between philosophers and, and poets. And of course, I'm on the side of poets. It goes without saying. And, and I see huge differences between the way a philosopher works and a poet works. The philosopher works through analytical uh, process of, of um, uh, refining notions, concepts. And the poet uh, works through leaps of faith or leaps of inspiration. And, uh, so, but somehow they both, they are maybe on the same, in the same territory, they share something. So it's an, 
But the best proof that after you know, almost 3,000 years, the, the tension still exists. Um, so, yes. It's hard to say, of course, I read my contemporaries, uh, but I think when you, when you write, you, you almost forget the, the models that are around you. And, and you follow your own path, which is partly programmatic and partly simply instinctual. You, it's, it's much more instinctual than programmatic. So I, yes, I, I, I want to save and put this moment of bliss, the moment of the imagination, without, without um, as you say, w without closing my eyes to the terror and, and misery. But I think poetry for me is here to, to, to uncover for us these for a moment, this, some, this, this, the, the better world of imagination, the better world of sense, we don't know exactly what it is. So yes, I'm a little old-fashioned, I, I think, and uh, I want to change, I'm afraid. Well, I, I didn't mean it was old-fashioned. I, I actually, I think there's too little of that. Yeah? Okay, I think. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Yes. I love the poems that you read about your father, and they make you want to ask, when you talk about, we you know every path in the woods, what were the landscapes that shaped you? Um, I, I think two landscapes. One that was the industrial landscape and cityscape in Silesia, where I grew up. Now it's getting a little better, but then the nature was really devastated by, by the industry. So I, my, my childhood was um, spent in, in this ecologically uh, 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 hopeless landscape. But, and the other landscape that more and more and what's important for me was the, this landscape or cityscape again of this city where I was born and which was lost. It was a purely ima imaginary uh, landscape or, or cityscape or both. So um, uh, I think I, from er early on I, I had these two strange realities. One that was just in my head and in the heads of my grandparents who lost the city uh, uh, and my parents too so uh, and now I think that maybe the other this imaginary landscape and cityscape was maybe more important than, than this uh, miserable industrial landscape I, I looked at the poem that you did, the electric elegy about the radio. Yes. I, 
I just, that, that poem I thought was just really remarkable. I mean, could you talk a little bit more about what led into that poem? I know uh -huh. you mentioned a little bit, but that, that was just remarkable for you. I remember I, I wrote it in Houston, you know, between the classes, not not like in five minutes between the classes, but in these days where, when I didn't teach. I, I don't remember exactly what was the impulse. I just remember how, how I loved this old radio. It was before television for me, so this old radio was everything. I just admired it immensely, the, the noise, the noises, the sounds, the music, and, and, um, and I remember, even now I remember exactly this, the smell, the clothes on this speaker, and this green eye that doesn't exist any longer, the radios don't need the green eye. Uh, so the green eye actually um, uh, was the the reason for me to write this poem, the, the, what happened to the green eye. Yes? You said that you write about 12 poems per year. But well, more or less, yes. Um, have you ever felt the sense that there is one particular poem that you've written, or several poems, which were sort of dictated to you, and you didn't need to do that much Editing after you wrote the first draft? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, for example, this one that I read tonight, this self portrait, this one, this is the switch from the, the third person to the first person. Uh, dictated is maybe too mystical a, a word, but it, I was incredibly happy to, when, when I was writing this poem. It came in a flash of. Uh, it actually came when I saw the reproduction of a uh, self-portrait by the New York artist Eric Fischer. He came to Krakow and he gave a lecture. And somebody mm, first introduced him and showed on the screen some of his better known paintings. And there, there it was, this self-portrait, which is completely different from mine. And, but has something that, in, in, a, in two minutes, I had this poem in my head. It just, I reacted so strongly to, to the self -port. You, you, it's very, you can go to you know, ericfischel.com, and this is the first painting that appears on. Uh, so it rarely happens the, the, such a violence such a, of, of, of the beginning of a poem. Yes. Um, you wrote a couple of self-portrait poems, um, and I was just wondering if you find that it's um, easier to write about yourself as opposed to like, outside things. And also, I was wondering if you had any more things you read. I, I didn't get. Can you say it again? Um, your self-portrait. Yes. Poem? Yes. I know. I was wondering if you had any, any more. If you had written any more um, other than the ones that you read, and also if you find that it's easier to write about yourself as opposed to outside. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, uh, for a long time I sort of along the line <coughs> of the m more recent Polish poetic tradition, I avoided writing about myself. Uh, the great poets of, uh, uh, of Polish language in the 20th century, like Czesław Miroz, or speaking of Herbert, or Szymborska actually never write about themselves. So I was a little bit tempted to change it, you know, to, to introduce this moment of, of a slight narcissism. But some of these, there are more of this experience. Some of these are actually not so much about myself. They are also about the world in which I live. And uh, sometimes it interests me even more. It's, it's just a, a formula which I like to, you know, of course I will not never write 700 self portraits, but some more perhaps, because it's, it, yeah, I, I, I simply love it. So.